It's my graduate, pl uh, graduate uh, great pleasure to introduce our associate professor, Joaquin Goni Cortez, uh, who joined the Purdue in 2015 as a faculty member in industrial engineering, biomedical engineering, and the Purdue Systems Collaboratory. So you can already tell that the, uh, Dr. Goni is a highly interdisciplinary in his uh, research work. So he received a PhD in physics and applied math in University of uh, Nevada, uh, uh, Spain. And then he did uh, his uh, postdoc actually at the Applied Medical Research Lab at the same university. And then also he had a postdoc and research uh, 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 opportunities at the IU, Indiana University, in multiple positions in psychological and brain sciences and the uh, Network Science Institute. So you will hear more about his research, but he does uh, truly interesting, outstanding work, uh, try to understand brain structure and functions uh, to see how they can affect our disease and behavior and uh, 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 cognition, okay? so. He has a journal publication in this area, 69 in top journals, and uh, his uh, citations are about uh, 5,000, which is uh, very strong in his career right now. So he received uh, multiple awards, uh, Purdue uh, Discovery Park Data Science Award, and uh, he received the Undergraduate Educator Award, Pritzker, which is uh, very competitive in School of IE, and he received uh, two times, including last year, and then uh, he received the College of the Teaching Award uh, 2021. Among his many uh, education uh, 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 contributions, one of the notable one is called uh, May Master. Okay, May Master is a uh, Spain uh, ab abroad program, and uh, students go there for about a month, and uh, they actually uh, take uh, courses in Spanish and uh, system dynamics from the Dr. Goni and they eat together, they visit you know, the industry, and then uh, you know, have some fun together. And I had a chance to talk with the, uh, I see uh, 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 Rachel Snow there, I was, uh, uh, who is our uh, first, who received the uh, first place of the undergraduate poster presentation last week. And uh, when I talked with Rachel, she was uh, very excited about this upcoming May master. And I see also Morgan, our undergraduate the advisor here, who will also join the, uh, the May master group in May. Okay, so let's welcome Dr. Goni Cortez to the podium. Good afternoon, everyone. Is, is this working? Okay, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm going to go through what I titled as a few highlights on my academic journey. Uh, I have to say it was really difficult to pick what to put and what not. I added the slides, I removed them, I went back and forth. <laughs> um, so I'm going to do my best to stick to time. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm going to take Dr. Son beautiful introduction. Thank you so much for it to skip a little bit on my academic background. I had a postdoctoral experience in Spain right after my PhD, a second postdoctoral experience in Indiana University, research scientist position, and then finally I joined Purdue in August 2015. A little bit more about my geographical, historical origins. I am from Pamplona. Pamplona is the capital of Navarra, which is an autonomous community in Spain. A couple of links that may trigger your interest. Yes, Pamplona is where it happens, the running of the bulls, and no, I have never done it. <laughs> And you also might know there is a strong connection between Pamplona and the U.S., thanks to the famous writer Ernest Hemingway, who actually wrote a book about the festivals in Pamplona and will honor us with his presence for literally decades as the festivals were, ha were happening every July. I want to start by my lab. After a few months I had joined Purdue, I started the complexity lab. It's not a typo. It's a fusion of connectomics and complexity with an M. I was remembering when I was doing this slide that at the beginning you could type in Google complexity and no hits were found. And then as we started publishing papers and getting to be known, now if you type complexity, it's not trying to correct the word to complexity, but actually you should find our research lab website. Our current members are Mintao Liu, Daniel Guerrero, and Madi Mohadam, who are here with us, undergrad student Rachel Snow, 
And I don't want to forget our fantastic alumni, uh, including Dr. Enrico Amico, who is now in EPFL in Lausanne as a principal investigator. Minusri Rajapandian, who is now, she used to be in Gecko Robotics, but I know that she has moved to another company, but she keeps, she keeps being uh, extremely successful in her career. We also have Michael Wang, who is in consulting. Uttara Timnis, who is in the Livermore National Livermore Labs. Uh, that was a great experience through a collaboration that was only possible because uh, BME, uh, our well-known school of biomedical engineering, took us as an initiative to Livermore Labs to try to foster collaborations. Not only we did a collaboration, but actually Uttara ended up after earning her PhD uh, working there. We have Kosar Abbas, who is now in industry. He is a senior researcher at Intel. And we have uh, Duit Wontrang, who just started six months ago his position as an assistant professor at the Naval Academy Department of Mathematics. I'm going to go very little, and this was a strong struggle, what to choose and what not, through the research I have done in my career. I want to highlight a little bit on the concept of network morphospaces, where maybe some of our work was relatively pioneering in the field. So mapping a network morphospace reveals the extent to which the space is filled by existing networks, thus allowing a distinction between actual and impossible designs, and highlighting the generative potential of rules and constraints that pervade the evolution of complex systems. So this topic of network morphospaces, what it's trying to do is to build a really low dimensional space, two, three coordinates maximum, in which we can understand any complex system that can be represented as a network or graph, which is nothing but a set of nodes and a set of edges or links connecting those nodes. In this paper, we try to tackle the concept of hierarchy. How can we determine or quantify hierarchy in complex networks with the additional challenge of dealing with directed graphs, which could be acyclic, where you have no cycles, A to B, B to C, C to A, for instance, but also that they could have any possible size degree, just a universal set of mathematically principled measurements in which every network, any directed graph, will have a set of three coordinates, which we name treeness, fear forwardness, and excuse me, fear forwardness and orderability. And then we went through the conceptual aspect of what are possible coordinates in this morpho space and what are not? Can different graphs of any size or degree or other characteristics fill the entire three-dimensional morpho space? And the answer is no. There are impossible regions that cannot satisfy certain level of treeness or their ability and fear forwardness. And then within the possible, what's possible from a graph theoretical perspective, where are the real systems living in this space? Do they occupy the entire space that is possible or actually systems uh, that come uh, from data from real systems occupy specific regions. And the specific regions of the morphospace that are occupied, are they theme related? Are language networks occupying certain type of the space and uh, energy communication networks occupying another space and food webs occupying a different portion of the space? And the answer to all those is yes, there is a specificity in the location. I'm going to skip the details and I'm going to the next concept. We also design a two dimensional in form, um, communication morphospace in which the x-axis is how efficient it is to explore a network when you are not aware of the structure or topology of the network. So you don't know, you, you are in a node, you want to reach another node, but you don't know what's the shortest path. On the y-axis, on the contrary, is for the same network a second coordinate, which is when I am in a complex network and I am in a node and I want to reach another node, how fast is to travel to the other node, given that I have full topological information of the system. Think about we're typing the GPS coordinates of a destination that we want. That will be the parallelism to a sort of path. And then we again played with the idea of the possible and the impossible. Where are any possible graphs, in this case of 50 nodes and average degree of four, which means that every node is connected on average to four other neighbors. What is possible and what is not in this morpho space? And then, we try to see, OK, now that we find, let me call it the perimeter on this morpho space of what is possible and what not, let's look how those networks look like. And it was really fun, and it was triggering me a lot of memories doing these slides. The worst possible network in terms of communication in diffusion, where you are not aware of the structure, or in routing, when you are actually aware of the structure. 
This was obtained computationally, but this is brilliant. This is a terrible network to navigate through. <laughs> this is a highly connected cluster with a very long corridor to another highly connected cluster. Any communication between cluster A and cluster B, even if you know the shortest path, is just horrible. It's really bad. And we discover all these topologies that go all the way to the one that is maximally efficient for both in a computational Pareto front multi-objective simulation. Then as part of my career, I was like, OK, I love complex systems. I love theoretical and simulation aspects of complex systems. Where could I apply this to learn more and to see what kind of domains could benefit from that? And then I enter into this fascinating world of brain connectomics. In brain connectomics, long story short, you have different brain regions in the cortex from which you produce, sorry, you don't produce, you estimate, you measure time series which represent neural activity with respect to time. And then when you do the pairwise correlations between all those time series, you end up with an object that from a mathematical standpoint is nothing but a correlation matrix. From a brain connectomics standpoint, it's called functional connectome, and it tells me for any pair of two brain regions to what extent they are functionally coupled. If you want for that subject doing whichever task the subject is doing, to what extent there is communication between those two brain regions. Now, automatically, you should be getting excited and thinking, well, this functional connectome is an object that is alive. My functional connectome right now, when I, want, when I was having breakfast this morning, or when I was sleeping not that much last night, is different. And then also, when subjects are doing the same task, it could be that different subjects have different characteristics in the functional coupling of the brain regions. So even when different subjects do the same task, there might be some differences. And this is how the concept of fingerprinting emerged of to what extent we can differentiate subjects, for instance, just to make it simple, when they are all doing the same task. So intellectually, it was incredibly challenging to me. And the game that is called identification rate is the percentage of times, so the value is 0 to 1, in which I give you a functional connectum of a hidden participant x. And you need to figure out this functional connectum belongs to who in a set of functional connectums in which I know who the person is. The rationale is you compare the functional connectum to each and all the other functional connectums, and either through a concept of distance or similarity, whoever scored the highest, excuse me, the highest, is your guess or your prediction of who is the subject. The percentage of times that you are access successful in this process is called identification rate or also simply accuracy. We, in collaboration with um, the group of uh, Luis Pessoa, develop a framework in which we try to be aware on the data characteristics in our way to measure similarity or distance in the functional connectomes. If you take two correlation matrices, and remember, functional connectomes are nothing but two correlation matrices, there are dozens of ways in which you can easily think you could measure either some similarity score or some distance score. But I'm going to use the brain actually as an example of things that are more principled than others. If I want to know on the perimeter, on the surface of the cortex, what is the distance between this point and this point, I could cheat and measure Euclidean distance. Except when you're measuring Euclidean distance, you're not really preserving or being aware of the geometry of your object. So yes, you're going to get a value, but that value is not truly representative of the distance between those two points. This is what we brought um, together with the group of Luis Pessoa as measuring geodesic distance, which is geometrically aware of the n-dimensional space where all the correlation matrices of that size occupy. So when doing that, Pessoa first and colleagues showed that accuracy, identification rate, percentage of times that actually you reconcile a functional connectome of a subject that you don't know who it is to the correct subject, systematically is higher when you actually use geodesic distance. Geodesic distance has a tricky challenge sometimes because geodesic distance needs the inverse of our correlation matrices. I'll make it very short and not painful, but for a functional connectome, represented by a correlation matrix to be invertible, I need more time points in my time series measurements than brain regions I'm using in my parcellation of the cortex. That means that if my task is relatively short, 
I cannot measure geodesic distance unless you do a concept that is called regularization. They use a fixed regularization on one, and we extended collaborating with them. It was a really fruitful collaboration that the amount of regularization that you do in your matrices matter as of what is the consequences in terms of the fingerprint. And we saw that actually optimal regularization to uncover fingerprints depends on the scanning length, on the brain parcellation, and on the task that you're looking at. We kept forward and I got absolutely obsessed with Riemannian geometry in which now you can project your correlation matrices to something that is called tangent space in which finally the Euclidean distance in that space is equivalent to the underlying geodesic distance in the manifold where all the correlation matrices live. If you accept me the metaphor, it's actually fairly similar or at least it has some strong similarities with the concept of building a two-dimensional atlas from, in this case, uh, planet Earth. You need to choose a reference point and then you do a projection where you try, to the best that you can, there are distortion issues, that the Euclidean distance between any two points represent, truly represent the distance that was happening in the original object. So by doing that, and I'm gonna skip some technical details, we actually saw that you can reach unprecedented levels of fingerprint on the same data set that were tested before. Well, the only thing we're doing is a tangent space projection, and we are seeing that for any task, any scanning length, not only test, retest, but now I take one monozygotic twin and I try to find who is the other monozygotic twin. Or I take one dizygotic twin and I try to figure out who is the other di uh, excuse me, dizygotic twin. We reach unprecedented levels of fingerprinting with accepting the challenge that in dizygotic twins, they serve as much genetic material as simply siblings. We are very far from getting 100%. We saw this for any fMRI task, for any brain parcellation, for any scanning length, and for the entire fingerprint gradient, not only test retest. As Son was mentioning, I'm very excited to share that the Pamplona, um, study abroad in Pamplona that I, I led in 2017 and 18, thanks to the really valuable support of Dr. Son, we are back to it in 2023. And I'm taking this slide to start saying my thank you slides, where I really want to thank Alfonso Larrayoz, who is the director of the Pamplona Learning Institute, Mikel Galvaris, who is one of the teachers that will teach our undergrads Spanish, Elizabeth Pearson, who was my partner in 2017 and 18 on this trip, and Morgan Curilla, who is going to be my partner in, in a month from now. So thank you all for making this possible, and thank you, Dr. Son, for supporting the program so much. I needed this statement. There are many people to thank you for my academic career that I will not be giving this presentation without their support, trust, empathy, and work. And I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. But I want to highlight Professor Olaf Spons, who brought me to the US and trusted me when I was just an interesting, a passionate scientist that didn't know much about anything. And he trusted me. And I was three years postdoc with him, Professor Ricard Solé one of the greatest minds in complex systems. And during my PhD, whenever I had a chance, I would escape to Barcelona for a week to work with him and his group, including Bernat Corominas Murtra, Carlos Rodriguez Caso, and Sergi Valverde. My probably best uh, collaborators from uh, IU School of Medicine, Professors David Kareken, Mario Chemichik, and also from Epidemiology and Biostatistics, uh, Jaroslav Hareslak. This is a great team in which I felt so supported ever since I joined Purdue, and we have great collaborations going on. My colleagues in the department, Jesualdo Scutari, Yu Wernji, Mario Ventresca, they were great colleagues, mentors, and whenever I needed something, they were always there for me, and it's something that I will do my best to propagate to our new incoming assistant professors. And in terms of leadership, Steve Landry and Abby Desmuth and our not new, but relatively recent had uh, son who have been so supportive to my career and my research. And of course, Dr. Patrick Brunes, who has been a pleasure to work with in all kinds of things from supporting the main master to helping me coordinate uh, all the courses that we teach. Big thank you to my team. There is nothing I could do without my team and I'm really grateful. So thank you very much. And there is nothing I could do without my family. My family is distributed into three countries. I have my wife, Diana, our son, uh, Santiago, seven years old, six and a half, and he wants to be a scientist, apparently. And 
Our family is distributed in Spain, where is my mother, Teresa, my sister, Maria, in-law, Miguel, and nephew and niece, Miguel and Teresa. We also have a branch in Colombia through my wives, where we have a lot of cousins and uncles and aunts. And Diana's parents are also here in Indiana, uh, Clara and Fernando, and they are all very supportive for me and my career. And I don't want to forget two dogs that represent a lot in my life, Yalita, who left us last year, and Mima, who is st still enjoying the life uh, with us. And thank you so much. Great, great presentation. So I forgot to mention that. Hello. So Rachel, I mentioned Rachel, and she was on the photo, and she was advised by uh, Joaquin. That's why another reason that I mentioned. And also, May Master program, it looked I mean, you may have noticed the program looks so interesting. I actually almost wanted to uh, participate, uh, but You're uh, very since I'm <laughs> moving, I'm moving from it. Actually, my family is moving, and you know, I cannot join it. But again, so thanks to all your uh, uh, contributions. So, any question for Dr. Goni Cortez? I told you that he does uh, very, very exciting the uh, research work, right? So. Okay, well, let me start with the mic. Yeah, thank you for sharing your fantastic work. Uh, that was very insightful. And I, I guess, you know, there is a piece of uh, for looking forward, right? So what is your research vision in the next uh, five or 10 years and uh, how College of Engineering can continue support the line of the researcher already doing so fantastic? So the next steps in the lab, um, I want to put more emphasis, more effort into longer projects where, for instance, we look at longitudinal data, how a functional connectome of a subject changes across time, let's think, for instance, simply aging, but also because of a disease progression, but also because of a therapy, or also because of a drug that is a treatment for certain disease. This needs to collect data for years and needs uh, that we make small steps in our computational models as the project acquires more and more data. And now that I'm an associate professor, I think I have the, the, the calm, if that makes sense, that we can pursue these projects that could be four, six, seven, eight years uh, of continuous work and until we truly get the value of how the functional connectomes evolve in the long term. I also have, in a shorter term strategy, a lot of interest in quick functional reconfigurations. What happens when a subject is finishing a task? Let's say playing chess. And now I tell you, OK, we have finished the game. Now we go to rest. Obviously, we don't go to rest. We're still thinking about that move or why I didn't see that queen there or that king. So the way we go back to rest after a highly engaging task, that was my metaphor for playing chess, is different across subjects. and. It's something that I'm extremely interested to keep digging into. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Hi, Joaquin. That's my <laughs> husband. Um, but this is not <laughs> planned. <laughs> not planned. Um, I'm actually shaking right now. <laughs> no. Well, something that I have always found very unique and interesting about your career is that you have worked in an extremely in interdisciplinary fashion. So you have your undergrad in, I think, informatics or computer engineering, PhD in mathematics, then you worked in psychology and network science, and now you're a professor in industrial engineering. Um, and so I was just wondering what, and, and I think that that's pretty rare, but hopefully will become more common in the space of engineering and research and science. What characteristics do you think about you have kind of allowed you to navigate that so well, and kind of what vision do you have for the world to become more collaborative? So as you probably notice, I am highly collaborative in interdisciplinary environments. I think it's part of my personality trait and my passion for science. I don't so much put labels, oh, this part of the world belongs to this category or this type of engineering or a psychologist or a neurologist. Obviously, there are some parts that are. But uh, what I truly like on interdisciplinary projects is when we really work together and we set the questions that we want to understand, and we set the modeling or the mathematical approaches that we're going to use to answer those questions, and then we just go and proceed, and it's something that I give a lot of importance to, in a principled manner. 
Um, I don't think this is good advice. I didn't have a clear plan when I finished my undergrad <laughs> studies or even when I pursued my PhD. It was purely coming from my passion for science and every step took me to the other. And I think I, I probably overca overcame my lack of planning through my passion for science. Great. Any other questions for Joaquin? OK, well, Joaquin, great presentation. And look Thank forward you. to continuing to see your continuous success next few years. OK, let's give him another round of applause. <laughs>